Fred and Edna went to the state fair every year. And every year, Edna would say, Fred, I'd like to ride in that there airplane. And every year, Fred would say, I know, Edna, but that airplane costs, ride costs $10, and $10 is $10. One year, Fred and Edna went to the fair again, and Edna said, Fred, I'm 71 years old. If I don't ride that airplane this year, I may never get the chance to do it again. Fred replied, Edna, that their airplane ride costs $10, and $10 is $10. The pilot overheard them and said, folks, I'll make you a deal. I'll take you both up for a ride, and if you can stay quiet for the entire time and not say a single word, I won't charge you. But one word, and it's $10. Fred and Edna agreed, and up they went, and the pilot did all kinds of twists and rolls and loop-de-loops and dives, but not a single word came from Fred and Edna. He repeated his tricks again, but still there was only silence. And finally, as they landed, the pilot yelled out, By golly, I did everything I could to make you yell out, but you didn't. And Edna replied, Well, I was going to say something when Fred fell out, <laughs> but $10 is $10. Husband, $10. Who should I be loyal to? What are my priorities? You know, we as Christians are constantly being bombarded with that same question. To whom or to what do we owe our ultimate loyalty. Somebody, some worldly good, some political party, some ideology. What's my ultimate loyalty to be in? Where does our ultimate loyalty lie? And as Christians attending church on Sunday morning, you already know the answer, but I want us to look at it from a different point of view, the point of view of Psalm 2, the second psalm in the hymn book of our Bibles. It follows the first psalm that tells us what a righteous person does. And now in the second psalm, it's going to tell us what a righteous person is loyal to. So here we go, our ultimate loyalty from Psalm 2. And you'll notice immediately if you're looking at the handout that there are four sections, each with three verses. So it's very symmetrically divided. So here we go. Let's start at verse 2, chapter 2. 2, 1 and 2, Psalm 2, 1 and 2. Why do they agitate the nations and the people? Why do they conspire in vain? They take their stand, kings of the earth, and rulers take counsel together against Yahweh and against his anointed. By the way, Yahweh, sometimes written in our English translations as capital L-O-R-D, is the name that God himself revealed to his people. Yahweh is not God the Father, God the Son, or God the Holy Spirit. Separately, Yahweh is the Trinity. It's the Trinitarian God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. It's the personal name of our personal God, our God, Yahweh. And against him here in Psalm 2, 1 and 2, there appears to be a widespread rebellion. So if you have the handout and you see a blank, number one with a word beginning with R, it is rebellion. Who's rebelling? Who's being disloyal? Catch the multitude of synonyms used of these wicked rebels. In verse 1, you have nations and peoples. In verse 2, you have kings and rulers. All are against God. This insurrection is global, engaged in by all who are in power and authority, and this is a rebellion against God's power and authority. This is disloyalty to the ultimate power and authority of the universe. And what do these disloyal rebels say? Verse 3, let us tear away their fetters and let us throw off from us their ropes. These 
revolutionaries and mutineers refuse to be under the control of any power and authority. They refuse to accept the reign of God over the universe. They refuse to walk righteously and they refuse to do righteousness. They are loyal only to themselves and to their desires. They are against God, anti-God, disloyal to God. God? Who cares? Stephen Hawking, the famous theoretical physicist, physicist at Cambridge University once said, I regard the brain as a computer which will stop working when its components fail. There is no heaven. There is no afterlife for broken down computers. That's a fairy story for people who are afraid of the dark. God? What God? There's no God to be loyal to. Or Richard Dawkins, the evolutionary biologist and atheist who once said, the God of the Old Testament is arguably, arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction. Jealous and proud of it. A petty, unjust, unforgiving control freak. A vindictive, bloodthirsty, ethnic cleanser. A misogynistic, homophobic, racist, infanticidal, genocidal, filicidal, pestilential, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic, capricious, malevolent bully. God? Loyal to this kind of God? While not as radical, utterances that decry the role of God are always, frequently, in many places, made by those in power. Even in democratic countries such as ours with a historic Christian tradition. President George W. Bush once said in Ellis Island, the ideals of America are the hope of mankind. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness will not overcome it. Really? That's from John's Gospel talking about Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is now America? And since I'm an equal opportunity political critic, I now quote President Barack Obama who once said, this country is the last great hope of the planet. America is the last great hope, not God. That's not good for America or for God. So whether it be Hawking or Dawkins, or these nations, peoples, kings and rulers or presidents, they all seem to espouse and unfortunately we all seem to tacitly endorse a dangerous theology of disloyalty to the ruler of the universe. Verse 2, they take their stand, the kings of the earth, and rulers take counsel together against Yahweh and against his anointed. And just like that, we have a new character introduced into the drama, the anointed. The anointed is the representative of God, his deputy. And I want us to notice that these disloyal rebels are both against Yahweh and against against his anointed. The same preposition against is used with both Yahweh and his anointed. So what I want to point out is that Yahweh and his anointed, whoever he is, are being closely linked as being on one side with the rest of the powers of the world pitted against them. And remember in verse 3, those wicked said, let us tear away their, plural, fetters, and let us throw off from us their, plural, ropes. Who's their, plural? Well, it's got to be Yahweh plus his anointed, his representative, his deputy. In other words, there appears to be some very close connection, even identification of these two parties, Yahweh and the anointed. They get the same prepositions. They get the same pronouns. Hmm, are they related? But we can't answer that now, so we're going to go on. So what does God think of this disloyalty, this rebellion, this revolt, this mutiny, this tumult? Verse 4, he who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord mocks them. So there's a second R word in your handout, the reaction. God's reaction to the rebellion. And God's reaction is laughter. Notice where he's laughing from, verse 4, he's in the heavens. And where are those insurgents and terrorists and anarchists? Verse 2, kings of the earth. So the one in the heavens 
laughs at those puny despots of the earth. Hey, y'all down there, little ants, little fleas. Ha, 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 ha. Those nations and people and kings and rulers dare pit themselves against God? Earthly tyrants against a heavenly Lord? We can't believe it. The psalmist can't believe it. Even God cannot believe it. He goes, ha, 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 ha. Because you see, there can be only one king. Only one. And he deserves our ultimate loyalty. Only this king. The only king. No one else to be loyal to. No one else to serve. Some time ago, Burger King opened its first location in Belgium. And they launched an online publicity campaign that asked users, who is the king? Burger King wanted folks to vote online for whom they wanted to be their king, a cartoonized version of the real Belgian king, King Philip, or a Burger King. The website read, two kings. One single crown. Who shall reign? Needless to say, this quasi-election caught the attention of the Belgian royal family, and through a spokesperson, the royals expressed their strong disapproval of the campaign. But the Belgian rulers agreed with Burger King on this. There can be only one king. Two kings. One crown. Who shall reign? The rulers in Psalm 2 and in the world today and anyone else who thinks then that they can take away God's crown and wear it themselves, loyal to themselves, not to God, those who think that, whether they be principalities and powers or ordinary people like you and me, they and we have another think coming. God's response to such mutineers and disloyal ones is, ha, ha, ha. But you know what? God's not going to laugh long. Verse 5, then he will speak to them in his anger and in his fury terrify them. This is no laughing matter anymore. This is serious. God is going to take terrifying action against those disloyal to him, the creator and Lord of all things seen and unseen, the king of the universe. Notice that there were four sets of agitators in verses 1 and 2. Nations, peoples, kings, rulers. And now look at God's reaction. It too is fourfold. He laughs, he mocks, that's in verse 4, and in verse 5 he speaks in his anger and he terrifies in his fury. Derision, scorn, anger, fury at those nations, peoples, kings, rulers, tit for tat. Are those disloyal ones in trouble or what? And then God speaks again in verse 6. But I myself have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. All those rebellious and disloyal rulers are going to be deposed by God's king. This must be the same person we saw earlier, God's anointed, but now he's called king. And this representative God, this of God, this anointed, this king is being enthroned where? In Zion, that's Jerusalem, on the holy mountain. You know what that means? That he's going to be enthroned, appointed in the temple. Wow. Who is this? Doesn't sound like a human king at all. And also see how God is emphatically appointing a king. Look at 2.6. I myself. God is taking action, categorical action, final action. The disloyal ones are being overthrown and replaced. In response to the nation's people's kings, rulers, rebelling and creating a ruckus, causing disorder and chaos and mayhem, God himself actively, personally, directly is going to install his king on his throne on his holy mountain. God's king versus all the other puny kings. But who is this person? This divine representative, this divine deputy, earlier called anointed, now called king. Well, that's a good question, but we don't have time, so we're going to move on. 
And suddenly in this next section, there is a shift of speaker. Now it's the anointed king himself who takes the microphone and speaks. And so that brings us to number three of the handout, the R word, the response of God's representative and deputy. Verse 7. I, this is God's representative, the anointed king, shall tell of the decree of Yahweh, likely the orders of appointment for this newly installed king. And then in the following verses, 2, 7, 8, and 9, the king really has nothing to say for himself except to quote what Yahweh has said to him. So this person's portfolio is to do nothing but the will of God who installed him. This representative's this deputy's pleasure is to do Yahweh's pleasure. And I want us to remember that. This representative's loyalty is to Yahweh totally, completely, and entirely. His sole and exclusive allegiance, his ultimate loyalty is to God and to God alone. I, and I want you to hold that thought. Now look again at what this representative, this anointed king says. Verse 7. He, that's Yahweh, said to me, that's the anointed king, you are my son. And if you're looking at the handout, you will notice that the word son, I have marked it as the Hebrew being the word ben. That will be important in a minute. That's the word son, ben. Today I myself have begotten you. Wait, what? First this individual was God's anointed. Then he was called God's king. And now he is God's son. And what of the son? Verse 8, ask of me, Yahweh tells the son, and I will give the nations as your, the son's inheritance, and as your possession, the ends of the earth. Remember where those rebellious people were from in verse 2? From the earth. But now Yahweh appoints the son to rule over. No, not just rule, possess the ends of the earth. Every dominion of those disloyal ones is overtaken and taken over. The ends of the earth are now going to be the anointed king's son's inheritance and possession from west to east, from north to south, in all continents, across all seas, over all peoples, rebels or rowdies, all disloyal ones, all, all are going to be under this one, anointed king son. Wow. Who is this person? The anointed king son. This is certainly no human king. Because in the history of Israel, there has never been a time when its borders are as widespread as this psalm imagines, the ends of the earth. So this cannot be a human king, and this has not happened until now, so this must be sometime in the future. This must be a divine person, God's anointed king's son, someone intimately related to Christ. And this must be talking about what's going to happen way down the line. In retrospect, we who live in the New Testament age know that this anointed king, son, is no one else but Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, fully man, fully God, part of the Trinitarian Godhead, part of Yahweh. This is the one who, was die, who died and was resurrected, redeeming us from sin. And guess what? This is the one who is going to come again in his second advent. This time the psalm declares he comes to reign as king over the ends of the earth. Of course, the New Test Old Testament saints and David who wrote the psalm would not have had a very clear idea of the identity of this person. But they'd have figured out that he was in some sense God's special representative in some form or fashion closely and intimately identified with God. Oh, and catch this in verse 2, the word anointed is in the Hebrew Mashiach, from which we get the English Messiah. And what is this Mashiach anointed king, son, going to do? Verse 9, you, this is God speaking to the anointed king's son, you shall break them, the disloyal ones, with a rod of iron like a vessel of a potter, you will shatter them. Those disloyal nations, peoples, kings, and rulers don't stand a chance against God and his anointed king's son. Rod of iron, broken, shattered, subdued, overawed, overcome. Those kings and rulers are loyal only to themselves and to their puny little enterprises. They think they are creating something grand and long-lasting, and God goes, ha, ha, ha. What they are doing are building sandcastles on the beach that will be annihilated 
in the powerful wave of God's anger and fury. And so what does God recommend to those rebels? Here it is, number four in the handout, the R word, recommendation. God's recommendation to those disloyal ones, 10, 11, and 12. So now, kings, be sensible. Be warned, judges of the earth. Serve Yahweh with fear and rejoice with trembling. Do homage to the sun that he not be angry. And you perish with regard to the path, that is, God's path that they were not following. For his anger may soon In light of this anointed king's son's rod of iron, all these unsubmissive, disloyal dissenters are warned to change their ways or else. Look at verse 12 again. Do homage to the son that he not be angry, and you perish with regard to the path for his anger may soon blaze. Who is the one who is angry? Must be that anointed king's son, right? But look back at verse 5. Then he, that is Yahweh, will speak to them in his anger. So in verse 5, it's Yahweh who is angry. And here in this last section of the psalm, it's the son who is angry. So both Yahweh and the son, both angry, are being identified closely and intimately together. No surprise to us who know that this Mashiach is Jesus Christ. Oh, and another intriguing thing about Psalm 2, in each of these four sections of the psalm, we see a distinct label, name for this divine representative. Verse 2 had anointed, verse 6 had king, verse 7 had son, that was the Hebrew ben, but we have son again in verse 12. Ah, but this time it's not actually the same word. It's not the Hebrew ben, but it's the Aramaic bar. So we now have four different titles for this unique individual, a different one in each of the four sections of Psalm 2. The anointed Mashiach chosen by God, the king installed by God, the son, Hebrew Ben, who will be the God of his people, and the son, Aramaic Bar, who will be the people of who will be the God of all people, no matter what language they occupy, what race or culture they are, what hemisphere they live in, what millennium they are living in. This Mashiach, Christ's sovereignty, is over everything and everyone in every age and in every place, even over those who vainly and disloyally attempt to reject God's reign. Those disloyal, rebellious ones had better submit or they are in trouble. While this recommendation is, of course, clearly for those disloyal and rebellious nations, peoples, kings, and rulers, there's a clear sense in which that recommendation is also for us, God's people. You know why? Look at verse 9. You, that is the anointed king's son, will break them, that's the disloyal rebels, with a rod of iron, like a vessel of a potter, you will shatter them. Now, I want you to listen to Revelation 2, 26 and 27, which I'm going to read. These are the words uttered by Jesus Christ to us, his followers. Revelation 2, 26 and 27. The one who overcomes and the one who keeps my deeds until the end, that is, all believers who have lived faithfully unto Christ, I will give to him authority over the nations And now catch this. And he, that's the faithful believer, shall rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of the potter are shattered. Jesus is quoting Psalm 2 and applying it to us, his followers. This is amazing. What God says of the anointed king son and what he will do, rule with a rod of iron and shatter rebellious people like earthenware, is exactly what his followers, you and I, will do when we, his people, reign with him one day. Wow. I had asked you to remember earlier that the son's exclusive and ultimate loyalty was to God. Well, if the ultimate loyalty of Christ who is going to reign and wield the rod of iron is exclusively to God, then if we... The followers of Christ want to reign and wield the same rod of iron with him. 
whom must we be ultimately loyal to? Just as Christ, the reigning king, is loyal to God and God alone, so we who are going to be reigning with Christ must be loyal to God and to God alone. Our loyalty is not to kings, peoples, nations, rulers. Nope. Our ultimate and final loyalty is not towards any person, institution, ideology, or political party. Our ultimate and final loyalty is to God and to His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is coming to reign and we with Him. If we are to rule with Christ, we too, like Christ, must be loyal to the royal. Loyal to the royal, to God and to no one else. Loyal to the royal. There are all kinds of voices today canvassing and demanding our loyalty. But there's only one person who deserves it, Jesus Christ, the only royal. And we need to be loyal to this royal. Bill Clem, Hall of Fame baseball umpire, holds the record of having worked 18 World Series games. His nickname was old arbitrator because he was known for being firm on the field with players and with his decisions. One time it was the bottom of the ninth inning. The winning run was on third base. The ball was hit, thrown home to get the guy out before he could touch the home plate. It was a real windy day that day and as the man slid into home plate, dust flew everywhere. Both sides erupted from the benches declaring success. The home team said, he's safe, he's safe. Visiting team said, he's out, he's out. Pandemonium because the game rode on the call. Bill Clem, and he was a big guy, took off his face mask, threw it on the ground, stomped on it and said, everybody shut up. Because it ain't nothing till I call it. 332 million voices clamoring in the USA. Democrat noise. Republican noise, white noise, black noise, and noise of every other color. Rich noise, poor noise. All kinds of noise, all howling and screeching their own opinions and all demanding our loyalty. But there's only one person's opinion that counts because it ain't nothing till he calls it. Only one voice matters. Only one ruler deserves loyalty. And our call is to be loyal to him, loyal to the royal, to the only royal, Jesus Christ. What can we do concretely in response? I'd like to share a simple application that I have begun to employ as a result of Psalm 2. At least once a day when I pray, at least once a day, I address Jesus as King. Yes, we use God and Father and Christ and Lord in our prayers to address persons of the Trinity. But at least once a day, I suggest that when we pray, we use the term King for Jesus, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Once a day, when we pray, address Jesus as King. This is to remind ourselves to be loyal to the only royal. No matter what your party affiliation, what your economic status, no matter what your race, tribe, tongue, nation, gender, marital status, for the child of God, there is only one King, King Jesus. And we are to be loyal to the royal. One day this anointed, this king, this son, this Mashiach is coming to reign. When will that happen, you ask? When is Christ going to take over and rule? Verse 12, for his anger may soon blaze. Soon. It's taken over 2,000 years since the son was resurrected. The psalm does not tell us when, and I have no idea. But one thing I know, look at the last part of verse 12. Blessed are all who
who seek refuge in him. One day Christ will reign and we with him. And he will put down all rebellion with his rod of iron and shatter the ungodly and the anti-God. But until that time, until that time during these days when we, the people of God, are a minority, in a world temporarily ruled by the disloyal and the ungodly and the anti-God, those nations, peoples, kings, and rulers, all shrieking and screaming their opinions, we, the people of God, the followers of God, future rulers with Christ, we are going to be loyal to the royal, seeking refuge in him, and we will be blessed. Blessed are all who seek refuge in him. He blesses all who seek refuge in his son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the anointed Mashiach, king, son. So let's be loyal to the royal. And once a day, address Jesus as king because he is the only king. Be loyal to the royal and be blessed. Let's pray. King Jesus, we thank you that you came once to die for us to be resurrected. We thank you that you are going to come again soon, this time to reign over the ends of the earth and we with you. But during these in-between days between your first and your second advent, O King, we pray that we, your subjects, would remain ultimately, totally, completely, exclusively loyal to you and to you alone. Because you are the only royal to whom we owe loyalty. Strengthen us through that Holy Spirit whom you sent upon us. And, O King, we eagerly await your coming in glory. Help us through the power of your Holy Spirit to be loyal to you, to become more like you, so that all glory, honor, dominion, and power would be unto you now and forever. Amen.